we have a fairly um, a fairly interesting group of people here. So I can imagine that the conversation that follows is going to be rather intensive. It's going to be also particularly interesting because my acquaintance with Steve um, tells me that you're in for an interesting session. It's been one of the real joys of my last year to get to know Steve a little bit, to work with him on council and on the website development. He's got a career that jumps back and forth between working in industry around design, uh, around information architectures, about semantic web and about applications, and also working in academia. He's currently in, a, in the UE, the University of West of England, but in the robotics lab. He's also working with a, pro a project called Farscope, which combines with Bristol University to do teaching. It's very applications oriented, but it's also developing the theory around robotics. But um, a few months ago, he entertained the council um, quite deliciously with his passion, um, which is the kind of machine we're going to hear about today and what it might provoke in us in terms of thinking about the future of what he's calling robo-psychology. So I give to you um, Dr. Steve Battle, academic, practitioner, thinker, and a bit of a possible futurist, we'll see. Um, Thank you. That's enough to, about uh, me. <laughs> to your session, Steve. Over to you. I will say I wore my special robot shirt today as I'm talking about <laughs> robot psychology. <laughs> right, I'm going to share my screen. Well, give me a moment. Um, desktop two. Excellent. I hope everyone can see the slides now. Um, uh, so thank you, um, Angus, for uh, inviting me for this talk. Um, it's, you know, quite daunting to speak to such an illustrious audience. Um, you know, normally I've got a classroom of uh, board students. Uh, so <laughs> to talk to uh, kind of real people, it's, it's an honor. Uh, so thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, so I've rather um, playfully entitled my talk, um, Robo Psychology. And you'll see that it touches on perceptual control theory and Breitenberg's vehicles. Um, but um, starting point is Robo Psychology. And um, I learned how to move to the next slide. I hope everyone has seen the film, I, Robot, starring Will Smith and um, Bridget Moynihan, who played uh, the, the wonderful Dr. Susan Calvin, um, who in this Isaac Asimov's fictional universe um, joined US Robots and Mechanical Men uh, in 2008, and she was there until 2057. Um, uh, but she was um, one of my heroes growing up because I was thinking, you know, well, how would you apply psychology to a robot? You know, surely a robot is a, a programmed machine. What, you know, what possible role is there for psychology? How could a robot have mental states, you know, what, what, is, what, you know, what would that even mean? Uh, I don't have an answer to that, of course, but I've got a, a partial answer, maybe, um, that we'll get to later on. But um, do catch the movie if you don't see it. But so we are doing robo psychology. Um, what does that mean? Um, I was doing these slides up until about uh, 5 p.m. today, so I hope I don't have too many, but um, I added this one early. I looked up robot psychology on Wikipedia, and it's uh, the study of the personalities and behavior of intelligent machines, at least according to Isaac Asimov. Um, so what we're going to do is to treat uh, robots as, as black boxes. That's a very cybernetic thing to do. Um, I won't really be looking at the kind of the internal gubbins of those things. Um, just going to observe the inputs and outputs. And we can use the, me the methods of experimental psychology. That's where um, the, the psychology comes in from robot psychology. And I'm going to use, of course, perceptual control theory, PCT, um, which was created by the wonderful and eccentric um, William Powers or Bill Powers. Um, we had a very good talk uh, at the um, Society Oh, how long ago was that? A couple of months ago, maybe. Um, December and January. Oh, no, December, okay, yeah. Uh, from representatives of the um, perceptual control theory um, community. 
and uh, they told us about PCT and method of levels, and that was a really impressive demonstration. Um, and it, it, it always um, had been a conundrum to me why uh, Bill Powers was never considered uh, one of the kind of the, the you know, the, the canon of uh, cybernetic literature, um, I, I, I do. And um, he never regarded himself as uh, really belonging to the cybernetics, cybernetics community. Uh, and that was a real shame, I think. But anyway, what was uh, Bill saying? So he was saying that um, control theory can be used to explain pur purposeful behavior. So he, he was really thinking, um, how can I apply control theory to psychology? Um, so taking his, what he knew about machines and applying it to people. So I'm gonna kind of turn that on its head tonight by kind of saying, well, I'm gonna now take it, take that and then reapply it back to machines, to robots in particular. Um, the key thing about PCT is that organisms control their perceptual input. So it's not, sometimes people speak loosely about control as if it were about the control of behavior, or you're trying to control you know, some device, um, but it's specifically about controlling your input, your perceptual input. It's not so strange, you know, this is how um, homeostats work, for example, that um, they're trying to keep a certain value input within a range, you know, the, if you take an essential variable. Um, so it is a very cybernetic thing. It's not alien to cybernetics. And indeed, um, Powers was inspired by uh, Ashby and uh, in his kind of hierarchical model, he's got homeostat right at the very uh, core or top of his system. Um, so you can't get away from Ashby. Um, so his machines, um, uh, or his, he's, he's describing organisms, people, um, he's saying, we're all control systems. We're trying to keep some control variable within bounds. That's really what PCT is about. Uh, if you've not read that book, I would recommend it. Um, and please indulge me for a moment. I wanna share this lovely um, quote from um, Bill Powers. Um, so he was saying, I began thinking about how negative feedback could become the basis of a theory of human behavior. Um, it was at the uh, VA research hospital in Chicago. I ran into analog computers, actually obtaining one for my own use and use it, using it less as a tool than as a mentor. From the Philbrick analog computer, I learned how negative feedback really works. So he was really um, hands-on with these analog computers of the, um, the early 1950s. Uh, so he not only kind of knew about them intellectually, kind of had a, a gut feeling to the way these things worked. Um, and the picture on the left is a module from the, uh, the Philbrick analog computer. I've, I've never seen one, uh, I'd love to see one, but I don't know if anyone's played with them, uh, but they sound um, delightful. Uh, the quotes at the bottom. So where I've quoted something or plagiarized, I've put, uh, the kind of a reference at the bottom where I can. Um, some of these ideas have roots in philosophy, of course. Um, they want to kind of get away from Kant. Um, I regard Kant as uh, essentially coming up with um, self-organization. Uh, he was the first person to talk about it. Uh, for him, science wasn't enough. Um, you know, he was thinking about telos or purpose. Uh, and he thought science couldn't account for the purposiveness of organisms. Um, so he described natural forms in terms of circular causality. They basically create and build themselves. Um, uh, the very heart of autopoiesis, in fact, isn't it? Uh, so he got there before Maturana as well. So a thing exists as a natural end if it is cause and effect of itself, which is lovely. That's been a critique of judgment. And Another uh, wonderful philosopher, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, um, his words here kind of um, very prescient, in fact, of um, perceptual control theory. He wrote this in the early forties. Um, so he's saying motor devices, he's talking about the brain, kind of the motor cortex, uh, appear as a means of reestablishing an equilibrium. 
the conditions of which are given in the sensory sector of the nervous system. So here he's saying it's about the primacy of perception. Uh, he was a phenomenologist. Um, you know, he got there before Sartre and the rest. They were all kind of uh, looked up to him, really. Um, but he, he knew then that it was really about um, uh, perception. And, and so the goals are set up in perception. So it's, it's the same really as PCT, that um, the, the goals or the purpose is defined by um, what you can perceive and what you're aiming to perceive. And of course, if we bring it back to cybernetics, we've got uh, Stafford Beer's um, Posy Wid. Uh, I, did, I ha hadn't heard of that, but uh, somebody came up in a talk a, a, few, um, a few talks ago. I think David might have come up with that, I don't know. Um, the, where he puts it very succinctly, the purpose of a system is what it does, um, which can't be right, um, but knowing the way stuff would be worked, um, for him, it's always the starting point of a conversation. Um, so uh, I expect if you challenged him on it, he would have come back um, with a response and then yeah, you'd go on like that. Um, for example, so a rock rolling down a hill is not purposeful. It's just, that's just entropy. Um, whereas goal seeking behavior is achieving um, uh, low entropy states, you know, unlikely states. And it's because of that, that we can actually um, basically find them. We can use some experimental method to detect the, the occurrence of these unlikely states. And that's again, the heart of BCT. So just in case nobody knows what a feedback loop looks like, here is one. Um, I've borrowed this from a wonderful book by Richard Markin um, uh, called Doing Research on Purpose, which is a lovely um, ambiguous title because he, he does research about purpose, but on purpose, of course. Um, so we have the traditional loop, but this is kind of put in the context of PCT. So you have um, the emphasis here is that the, the reference goal is set internally. So the internal stuff in the controller, the organism is in blue and anything in the environment is in green, of course, green environment. Um, so the reference goal is set by the organism internally. And of course, the, uh, the controller interacts with its environment, the world. And so we've got, have, you have the world coming in, it's transformed by some input function to produce a perceptual signal, the, a signal about the world. Uh, the core theory behind PCT is that we, it detects an error between what it wants to see and what it's actually seeing. And that goes via an output function. You know, these functions are implemented by neural networks, presumably in an organism. And that causes some physical output through effectors into the world. It's mediated by physical laws in the world, but eventually it, it loops back to the, uh, the input via controlled variables. I mean, there are lots of variables in the world you can measure, but a particular organism is interested in, in uh, controlling a particular variable. Uh, this could be, you know, its body temperature, sugar level, um, proximity to food, something like that. So how do we, uh, you know, discover whether one of these um, control loops is in operation? because um, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and one approach that um, Bill Powers hit upon was to try to introduce a disturbance. Um, so it's a bit, you know, if you know the stories about um, Ashby again, you know, with his homeostat, he used to kind of poke about and fiddle with the dials in his homeostat to kind of um, annoy it and coax it into seeking a new setting. Um, so we can disturb this thing and see if it can maintain equilibrium, basically. So we, as experimenters, we introduce a disturbance there at the bottom, again, mediated by the physical world, physical laws, to poke the control variable. And we want to see, is this system able to maintain a value of this control variable despite what we're doing to it? Um, so we're trying to upset it, 
and it's resisting us. So let's say a negative feedback loop. So um, PCT has been very successful in um, uh, experimental psychology um, in looking at things like how do fly ball catchers catch a ball? These are balls coming in from high up, um, often out of the sun, and you've got to kind of get yourself in the way of a ball. Same thing in cricket. I guess it's not all, all baseball. Um, so these are called the fly balls coming in. And received wisdom was that um, it was the linear optical trajectory. So this ball was going in, in, along a line and you want to try and position yourself as the catcher at the kind of one end of the line where the ball is coming in. Um, and that was quite an advanced idea in itself. You know, it's kind of saying, well, you're not doing advanced maths. You're not computing the trajectory or just simplifying it down to a, a line, a linear op optical trajectory. It's the optical trajectory across your eyes. Um, but using perceptual control theory, um, Powers and Markham were able to show, no, that it's, that model is not robust to people poking this thing with disturbances. Um, and they proposed a different hypothesis um, that you're just trying to control the lateral displacement. So just, you're just looking at side to side movement because um, there's, there's not a lot you can do going back and forward. So you're just moving side to side, trying to get in the way of this ball, eventually hope when it lands you're in, in, in the way of it. So their idea or their new hypothesis was that they could treat the capture as a control system, come up with a hypothesis, do the experiments, build a model, and come up with an answer of um, you know, how people catch fly balls. So it's been very successful uh, in those kinds of experiments. And that's the kind of experimental psychology we're talking about. So it's the, the psychology of behavior. So the great thing about um, PCT and is that it has this um, methodology um, that comes with it, the test for the controlled variable. So um, we can actually put it to use and try it out. It's not just some sort of ab abstract concept. It's not philosophy. It's a, it's a methodology. And that's, that's really powerful, uh, especially something to have in cybernetics. Um, it's a way to do experiments and we can actually try it out and see if it works. So here it is. So I've touched on most of these points already, but just stating them here is kind of maybe helpful. So you develop a hypothesis about you know, what is being controlled. Um, obviously, you've got to be creative about that. It's not, you know, it's, most of these experiments, it's actually quite hard to work out what's being controlled. And you kind of got to let go of um, your assumptions. Um, you're assuming the system's got a goal state, a reference condition it's trying to achieve. So you let the system go to equilibrium and measure that the state of your hypothesized variable uh, equ equilibrium. So that's, you're assuming it's gonna try and bring it back to that target when you disturb it. So we introduce this disturbance. If we've got multiple hypotheses, we should try and think of dis disturbances that may distinguish between different hypotheses. Um, so, but if one of these hypotheses is correct, um, the system's behavior should be to correct that. And one we can do that, so we take measurements and we try to find either correlation or kind of reduced error um, uh, from, from that goal or reference state. Oops. Okay, now I haven't mentioned Breitenberg's vehicles yet. Um, so Breitenberg's vehicles, wonderful book. You can see the cover on the left there. A tiny book. Um, it's probably the book I keep coming back to most on my bookshelf because um, I'm obsessed with trying to simulate every single one of them in the book. I think there's 14 or so. I'm only up to number eight. Um, so <laughs> it's uh, every year or two I get it out and think, oh, can I simulate another one? So I'm only going to look at the first two because um, they're, well, the simplest ones. <laughs> so it describes... Um, Vehicles for thought. Um, so Breitenberg, he's a he's a, describes himself as a cybernetician, as a uh, and a, a neuro um, neuroscientist as well. Um, so these were simple models that kind of capture the essence of a simple organism, 
uh, or some simple Sorry, theory so about brain in a meeting, science. So a bit later, say six thirty. Hi, David. <laughs> Um, so, for example, vehicle one, so vehicle one's got, you can see from this diagram, it's got an eye at the front, it's got a wheel at the back, which is kind of the motor, and then a single kind of neural fiber connecting the two. So the input directly drives the motor. And vehicle two, it's got two eyes at the front and two wheels, and the, it's got this kind of crossover, a little bit inspired by the way our eyes cross over in the brain. So input from the left eye goes to the right hemisphere. And vice versa. So it could describe simple things like um, a bacterium, um, which uh, have a very simple flagellum at the back uh, and a tiny little motor. Um, people thought, you know, people think, thought motors didn't exist in nature, but yeah, this, they've got little motors that rotate about 100 revolutions per second, incredible. And if you're thinking about E. coli, um, if it runs one way, it's driving the E. coli forward. If it goes the other way, then it kind of tumbles about because the flagellae kind of break up and um, it does a random tumble. So it's a little bit similar to an E. coli bacterium. Vehicle two, um, I saw these wonderful pictures of a, a trilobite on Twitter the other day. I thought, oh, that's just like my, um, my robot. It's got these wonderful... 360 degree eyes, so it can see behind it, uh, but lovely, simple compound eyes. Um, uh, yeah, beautiful little um, machine. <laughs> um, and here's my Lego version. You can see it's um, kitted out with 360 degree vision. This is my, my vehicle too. But um, yeah, you know, we can think of the motors as driving wheels like in the Lego model. Um, but it could be sensing a chemical gradient like a bacterium. But um, vehicles, they're not really practical robots. They're, um, they're thought experiments. One of the lovely things about Breitenberg's book is that it basically gives you the circuit diagram for its brain. You know, here we've got a single nerve fiber and this lovely poetic description of the behavior of this thing. So um, he talks about these vehicles loving system. You know, they love to move towards the light or they recede from light because they hate the light. Um, so they it's wonderful descriptions of them. Um, in particular vehicle one makes use of um, friction. So as it drives forwards, imagine it's kind of tiny and kind of it's being buffeted by water molecules, Brownian motion, so it's being, its angle of heading is randomly changing. So it's gonna deviate from its course. So if you type in that URL, go UEAC UK V1, I've got it running here. This is a simulation of vehicle one. Uh, I can switch to Chrome, you refresh. Um, so it's, if it can see the light, it can't see behind itself. So it doesn't move if it's not facing the light, but it's got um, kind of 180 degree vision and it moves in proportion to the kind of the light energy falling on it. So it does kind of move towards the light. If I start it again, it all, always ends up moving towards the light. So it's reasonable to think, oh, maybe this is a, you know, how would I begin to analyze this in terms of um, perceptual control theory? Uh, and you know, what kind of experiment could I do to work out um, if it's got a controlled variable, does this thing control a variable? Um, I showed this to one group of people and um, they said, oh, it's, it's clearly using positive feedback because it gets faster and faster as you get to the, um, as it kind of homes in on the, uh, the light. But uh, I think that's a bit of an illusion. Um, it does go faster as it gets towards the light source because there's more light energy available. Um, but I did another simulation in a one dimensional kind of um, maybe lineverse um, where you know, light energy doesn't fall away with um, the inverse um, proportion. Um, you know, so in, in that one dimensional universe, um, it moves at a constant speed or not at all. 
So there's, that doesn't appear to be any kind of feedback loop running here, or no positive feedback loop rather. So the question is, is there a negative feedback loop? So what could the control variable be? Um, we've seen that it seems to home in on the, um, on the light source. So maybe its purpose is to um, control its position or its distance from the, from the light source. Maybe that's its purpose. It's a, is it a purposeful system? So that's my hypothesis. I'm working now my way through now the, the methodology for the test for the control variable. So V1 controls for position. Um, and the disturbance I'm gonna introduce, there's not a lot you can do in this very simple world. You know, there's, there's a vehicle and then there's a light source. Um, so one thing I can do is to move the light source about. So I'm just gonna add a, a sine wave to the X position of the, of the light source. It'll move to side to side. And I'm basically saying, is the robot gonna follow the light source? Um, I've said controls position because I'm going to use um, correlation because there's two things we can do. We can either measure correlation of one thing to see if um, if it's got you know, if it's controlling something, um, or we can use basically a root mean square deviation. So you measure either measure the error, so do a subtraction, or do a, a correlation. Um, so there are two methods that have been used in a TCV. The only problem with correlation is that um, it can be off by a constant. So it, it, whereas error, you can kind of pin it down to a particular value. But I wanted to try out both methods. So I'm using correlation for this one. Um, I'm not gonna look at, that's the formula, but it comes up with a very high value, it's close to one. So it's, it's highly correlated with the position of the lamp. It does follow, the, um, the light source, which isn't surprising. Um, but dot, dot, dot. The problem is that um, perceptual control theory is about the control of perception. And this little vehicle can't perceive its distance. It doesn't know where it is and it doesn't know its distance from the light source. So it seems to be, um, yeah, although it's acting as a controller, um, it's not using negative feedback. So the only conclusion is that it must be an open loop control system, um, which, you know, they do work. We use them to control our kind of, um, you know, you might have your heating come on at night, that's an open loop control system. Um, and you might describe it as a classic kind of stimulus response system. So you put, put in an input, the light level, and you get an output, which um, feeds back into the environment. And it, get, it does get closer to the, the light, but it's, um, yeah, sadly, this vehicle can't um, perceive that. So it, it doesn't know it's achieving its, um, this goal that we're um, ascribing to it. So, we can't really say that that's its purpose. I think, you know, these are open questions. I only kind of, um, only recently kind of came to that conclusion. So I might still be wrong. So I kind of value your input on that. Vehicle two um, is a little bit more interesting. So vehicle two, um, again, Breitenberg gives this very poetic description. It's, it's all about fear and aggression. So we have the URL there. So go UEAC UK V2. I'll just show you that briefly. So this is vehicle two. And if I, so its initial behavior is to, is to run aggressively towards the, um, there's a bit of an overshoot there, towards the, the light source. So basically if there's more light on one side, the, the wheel on the opposite side runs faster. And that eventually kind of puts it into a stable orbit and a nice circular orbit as well. So it's not even elliptic. That's aggression. Fear is kind of when you don't do the crossover, it just kind of boringly runs away from the light source. It's afraid of the light. 
but it always goes into a stable clockwise or anti-clockwise orbit. So maybe this one's a little bit more interesting to, for analysis. Um, PowerPoint. So whereas um, vehicle one um, could only look forwards, um, so um, yeah, this this robot's got a, a 360 degree view, so it can actually see behind it as well. It's got two eyes. I put them 90 degrees out of phase, um, so we've got the red and the blue lines there. Kind of, so it basically gives us a sine and a cosine function of the input. Um, and this means that it can actually reconstruct um, angular information. So it, 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 there's enough information here to give it the angle to the light source, um, because with a sine and a cosine wave, you can, you, know, you, can, you can draw a circle. Um, yeah, they're unrectified, so it's not cutting the bottom off like the vehicle one. Um, so there's kind of an equilibrium. So dead ahead is pi over four. You can see they balance out nicely. Um, so you've got a, the, the, the light level on the left and right side is equal. So it's going to, both wheels are going to run at the same rate. So it's going to go straight forward. So that's when the light source is dead ahead. Um, but there are other equilibrium um, at kind of plus minus 90 degrees where kind of the, it's the, you know, the, the positive sine wave is equal to the negative uh, cosine wave. So if you subtracted them, they, they would come out to zero. So there are other points where they, they balance out. So maybe that's what's happening. There's something called a dorsal light reaction in moths. Um, this is why they get trapped um, around lampposts. They're trying to, you know, they're, they're trying to fly the right way up, basically. You, you keep the light sky above you, um, but they, they evolved before street lights. So maybe our robot's got something like a, a dorsal light reaction. So it's trying to keep the light not dead ahead, but to its side. So here's my hypothesis. Um, well, this time I've got two hypotheses that I'm trying to distinguish between. Maybe it, um, it's trying to control brightness. That was my initial um, gut reaction after I kind of created the simulation. I thought, well, it seems to be holding a stable orbit. Um, so maybe if I, if I turn down the light level, maybe that orbit would shrink and it would get closer. Um, another hypothesis is maybe it's, you know, it's got this dorsal light reaction. It's keeping the, um, the light to its left or to its right at 90 degrees. So I couldn't really tell just by watching it, which one of those was the case. So the disturbance I'm gonna introduce is to vary the luminosity of the light source. Just so it's not moving about like last time, it's staying where it is and it's just getting um, dimmer. So if it's controlling for brightness, you'd expect the orbit to shrink. Oh, sorry. Um, so these are the results. Um, so basically I'm, we've got a reference variable you can see at the top of the table. So that's the kind of, the the measure of brightness and the angle um, when it's equilibrium, kind of just going nicely around the circle. And then I started reducing the luminosity from 90% down to 10. And I'm now recording the um, uh, kind of a, the error, the difference of, of the kind of the actual brightness or angle from its reference value. And um, you can see there's that 7.2 is a massive error. Um, Actually, I normalized it. So 1.1, it's still a massive error. Uh, it's what, uh, two orders of magnitude bigger than the error for the angle. So we can see here that the angle is a better hypothesis. The error is smaller, or the deviation is smaller than for brightness. Um, so we can say, well, it's um, basically, when you, when you look at the experiment, you can see the orbit doesn't shrink. Um, it's maintaining a stable orbit. So the orbital size is actually a function of its um, the axle width of the robot. Um, so it, it's once it's settled in on the angle, it's it's all the orbit size is just due to the mechanics of the of the, the the width of the wheelbase. 
So those are the results of vehicle two. So the conclusions of this all are that vehicle one, um, I think, um, is an open loop control system, um, not, not positive feedback. Um, so therefore, outside the scope of perceptual control theory, we can't use PCT to say that vehicle has got a purpose to, um, uh, you know, to stick near the, the light source because it can't perceive that. And then vehicle two, um, it does seem to be a closed loop negative feedback controller. Um, and its purpose is to control its angle to the light source. Now, these are experiments, so, so we can't prove that's the case. You know, it's possible someone could come up with a different hypothesis that would have an even lower error. We could say, well, that would then be the, um, the case. So it's, we can't basically read off the system what its purpose is. You've just got to be creative and do the experiments. Um, So I'd be interested to see if you agree with my conclusions, because uh, I think they are a little bit controversial. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> so that's me finished. Um, I welcome your questions. Thank you. I shall, shall I stop sharing or you, somebody might ask me to go back to a particular slide. I'm not sure. Why don't you stop sharing to begin with, and then you could always go back and I show can. something yeah. if you need okay, to, to so answer anything. Would that make go. sense? Yes, hello. Um, Steve, so, I'm you. sorry if that was different to your usual talks, you know, a little bit more technical. Uh. <laughs> you don't need to be apolog apologize. It's, it was wonderfully, uh, it was good to be technical. What's wrong with being technical? We are, right. we are a scientific body. It's good. Um, and I, I think it will be interesting to make some crossover at some right. point. Between. I can see in the chat. My Lego version is um, currently um, <laughs> <very good. laughs> being, being reprogrammed. And um, just let's, can you just clarify one thing for everybody? So you, you make, um, there seem to be two different kinds of experiment. One is you have a physical machine that you actually make and it does some things. And the other is you, you write some code that does something that has the same characteristics. Uh, you understand as the machine that you would make. Mm. So in some sense, you are embedding into, in each case, you're embedding some form of design into the thing that you're making, whether it's into a software design or a physical design. And the question I would ask is, can you just clarify why there is uncertainty, given the fact that you've created the design, some uncertainty about how it works, with avoidance <laughs> of doubt? <sighs> Because I think we're coming up a level. Now we've got a description at the computational level of what goes on inside this robot. That doesn't tell you what's going on at a robo psychological level. I believe that's coming up a level. It's like going from physics to chemistry. Um, so you can't read off from the computational or the, or the mechanics, it's psychology or what or its purpose you know the only the only concept we've got here in its psychology is purpose um, so that that's all it has but even then you can't read that off from the lower level so basically you can't reduce that to the low, lower level okay and one more question then before i turn it over can you just clarify for everybody exactly what is the relationship between you have the eyes so eyes effectively are picking up some kind of signal light seems to be the type of signal that it's picking up. And mm. this has an effect on the mechanics, whether they're software mechanics or physical mechanics of what it does. And um, uh, that's, it's all implied, but just for the sake of being clear, how does that work? Um, Python. <laughs> Python. Magic of Python. Uh, yeah. So it's a, a small microcontroller, this is the Lego EV3 microcontroller um, running MicroPython. So you're, you've got lovely light sensors on the front. Um, so you basically, you read the light levels and you set the motor speeds accordingly. And the simulators work the same way. It's JavaScript, you know, so and it's all simulated light, but at least a, a physical model's got real light involved in there. Thank you. All right, we're open. We're a fairly small group. so. Uh, although I might jump in and out, I think we can also probably offer uh, operate with a certain amount of social tact and respect for each other and ask questions and listen to answers. 
and try and follow the line of the conversation as it unfolds. Who would like to begin? Uh, I suggest that we start okay. by asking questions. Well, we got hands up. Um, we got hands up. Yeah, go. Steve, Should fascinating. Oh, yeah. I, missed, I, I missed the beginning. I apologise. Um, I'm slightly confused. <laughs> so, so am I. <laughs> so I, I'm confused because it, in, from the way I look at things, behaviour is what it does and purpose is why. So the observation is it does what it does and, and why would seem to be logically derived by a combination of code and structure. So I'm not quite sure what the confusion is of what's kind of going on, if you see what I mean. Yeah, um, so you can predict everything from its code and structure, of course. Um, you can predict its behavior. Um, and, you know, obviously these vehicles have been around for a long time. People have done a lot of work on them, showing, you know, describing their behavior, that sort of thing, um, inspiring other work. Um, so I was, when, when I kind of come across PCT, I was delighted I could actually say something new about these vehicles. Um, that hadn't been said before, which is um, you can talk about the why, in this case, just the purpose. Um, and I don't believe that can be kind of read off or predicted from the, the computational or the, you know, the mechanics or the system. It's you've got to do experiments on it to see what it does um, in simulation or, uh, or in hardware. Um, but I, I don't know of any way to read off the why from from the code. I'm I'm just really struggling with the, with 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 the why concept since you know operating in in any world scenario, whether it's a artificial world or a, a physical world, the 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 movements, which is what you're looking at relative to the source, are, are based on the structure and the interacting forces on that structure in the environment that it's within. And it's being driven. If you took the code away, it wouldn't be doing anything. So that's right. Yeah. So I, I, I can't. I don't get the. I don't get the purpose. The, the, the you know, I, it's, you know, God's hand in the machine or whatever. Well, it's, it's I, I just don't. I, it's, I'm, I'm just not getting it yeah. somewhere. So I'm either being terribly thick or terribly thick. I guess. It's just that things are more than the sum of their parts, um, and it's the magic of feedback loops that creates. Uh, a new level, I think, a new level of description um, where we can talk about um, the, the purpose in terms of what is it, what 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 essential variable is it trying to control, and that is its purpose. And I couldn't, I, you know, I wrote the code. I couldn't tell you um, what the I couldn't. It took me several guesses to to find these essential variables, uh, even though you know I built them, wrote the code. Mm. I was clueless. Should we move to a question from, is it Pile? Is that how you say your name? Yes, and that quite follows on the purpose question, because it struck me that we define purpose by whatever rules we give ourselves for defining it. So it has mm. to be at a level, and we simply need to agree on by what rules do we do this. You've chosen to go through looking for an essential variable. People can also define purpose based on what they think is going to be achieved by doing whatever. But my other comment is Very when true. showing the flyball image and that noting that the difference was between a linear versus a lateral, it struck me that perhaps in any situation, it, it may be progressive, that you may start with one function until you refine it at a, at a later moment by using a different function. So you would not necessarily have to have a singular uh, may, way of organizing something. You may have a progression of ways. Yes, uh, I think, yeah, basically the, you know, the lateral positioning is kind of the, the superior solution to the, the, the linear solution. And you can, you can imagine a kind of a, a homeostat kind of brain thrashing about trying to find 
the, the best way of doing it. Um, because yeah, there, there are kind of weaknesses in the kind of the linear solution. Um, you might start running first towards the linear one, and then as you get closer, refine. Yes, yeah, yeah. And obviously different people are gonna have different um, solutions to these as well. But isn't um, linear and, and lateral, uh, aren't they just specific examples of what works best in the in the operational mode which is that it should look right so you, when you're trying to catch a ball the process should look right right up to the point of you catching it then the question is well how does it how do you go about having it look right and when it's at a distance you may find that there's no real difference between linear and lateral but as it gets closer lateral becomes obviously what is actually going on yeah yeah so that's all about the kind of the ingenuity of the experiment you set up to tell the difference between those two different scenarios and you know they found that most fly ball catchers use their you know their approach of kind of moving side to side or just looking at the, the ball's variation from side to side not not the linear trajectory that they um originally thought and presumed mm -hmm. So yeah, because you know, my, my first assumption about the robot was that it was controlling the brightness. You know, it seemed to be obvious that you know, the, the brightness was holding it at a certain um, in a certain orbit, but that wasn't uh, the case. Just we've got one question: Is there any any anticipatory behavior that not in these vehicles, um, or not in certain, not not in vehicles one and two, um, uh, not in any of the vehicles I've. Um, uh, simulated yet. Um, the, the latest one's got a homeostat in it, which I don't think is anticipatory. Uh, so, Mike. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Yes, thank you. Oh. Um, I had a go at reading the book. Very, very hey. interesting. Um, and I guess my question would be a thought experiment, if you wouldn't mind, which is if you imagine yourself. <laughs> yeah, I've got the paper back though. <laughs> it's easier to fold into my carry bag. <laughs> um, if you imagine yourself to be a Brattenburg vehicle, I wonder what the light is that you're heading towards. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's um, can I build a machine I, I recognize as an other? Ah, another you or another? No, another being another uh, being so, so not necessarily a human intelligence but um just that's there you know in some way so responding to light and aware that it is responding to light yeah so wow. a machine with a sense of self wow okay good luck <laughs> thank you <laughs> so uh, david yeah. yeah uh steve thanks very much it really helped me to sort of anchor my uh, lack of grasp of some aspects of um, conceptual control uh, theory. It's very neat and straightforward in some respects. When we talk about these things like purpose and so on, you could probably do raise all sorts of hackles among various sort of flavors of philosophy of science. That's the idea. <laughs> well successful uh, and <laughs> yeah uh, if you sort of guard yourself by saying this is metaphorical you're probably in safe territory uh, if you're a bit more absolutist about it or even constructivist I think you raise sparks or um, com confusion well, I mean we all attribute we uh, uh, the hyperactive agent detector, which um, Dawkins has popularized, is something that we can't stop ourselves doing and attributing to things in the world uh, around us. So, and part part of me is curious. I mean, are you a sort of uh, uh, Gilbert Ryle concept of mind philosophical behaviorist here, or are you working to? something else or are you as muddled as I am um I haven't finished yet um I'm, I'm also interested uh, second or third point is 
in in seeing how in hearing about how you're developing it on from what you've explained to us um very well um so far and um i i guess i'm interested in how uh, able you are to sort of teach these things to younger students i've done very introductory robotics with 10 to 12 year olds and they typically get it far better than all the teachers around that um, you can find. I think it may be one of those things which is sort of culturally wiped out with secondary education uh, in some aspects. Uh, and uh, yeah, what more do you expect to teach or, or, or for people to learn about this? Obviously, I want to see how much I can, um, you know, incorporate in my ultimate uh, book on control and cybernetics for kids, but uh, that's an aside. Um, so I, I, I got three points there. So you know, cybernetics was, was founded on uh, purposeful systems. You know, the, the early conferences mm. were about purpose. You know, the first paper was about purpose. So it felt to what me like- Current purpose. <laughs> it, it, no, I think, you know, early cybernetics claimed the word purpose for machines, but it, I think we've lost it since and kind of the, mm. the physicists have kind of fought back and said no there's no purpose in the universe it's all it's all physics um whereas we've got to reclaim it get back to our roots you know as cyberneticists Pur purpose is what cybernetics is founded on um i'm not a behaviorism a behaviorist um and i think it's the negative feedback loop that breaks that cycle you know it is behaviorism is about trying to reduce living systems to stimulus response systems that you kind of the given input there's a certain output and we can see vehicle one's you know, got, there's a behaviorist explanation for vehicle one but not for vehicle two um, because you you lose its purpose in behaviorism and kids yes i've done workshops for kids um, on breitenberg's vehicles um had kids as young as five you know I, I was trying to show them how to code and i realized oh you, you can't read <laughs> and, uh, but you could they they can still they can no they can still see the symbols on the buttons so you can say okay this yeah. is the this triangle makes it go uh you know yeah. try pressing the triangle then then try now press the square it stops you know so kids gonna kind of feel electrical circuits before i could read but i was a late reader <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, so classes with um you know under tens um building different Breitenberg vehicles and then just getting them to do experiments with them. Um, so simple Arduino based robots. Yeah, yeah it's, great. it's lovely doing that kind of class. <laughs> and I'd love to hear more about, you know, what you're doing next, but I don't want to steal too much airtime. <laughs> uh, have we got any, any more questions? You've got, still got your hand up, David. Gerard is, just go for it, Gerard. Well, <laughs> it's, not <clears throat> of course um i wonder um you focus on the um let us say the item the thing in this case uh, the weitenberg um car uh, but you might also <clears throat> focus on the type of experiment so if i understand you now what you have been doing is actually trying to develop uh, experimental setup in which you can put different type of organisms or uh, robots in order to identify whether or not they have a purpose or whether or not they change the purpose over time. So, for example, if instead of uh, <coughs> a car you put in a human in your experiment, <clears throat> And one possibility you mentioned already, that is somebody catching a ball. So one of the things you might be interested in is what is the control variable if you try to catch a ball? Uh, I remember that uh, the most obvious hypothesis is that uh, you look at the first differential and put it at zero. And so as long as the ball doesn't change, you will catch it. If you put a human instead of a ball in uh, that uh, position, 
then possibly you might see that, as mentioned already, I think by Philip, uh, that people change uh, purposes. And so it might be possible to actually identify what the range of purposes is that you try to see through your experiment. Um, would this be something that you would be interested in? What is the experimental setup instead of what is the um, uh, object that moves such that I can identify whether or not there is a purpose? Yes, I mean, one bit of research we're doing at the moment in the lab is to, um, and I'm, I'm, as well as controlling Lego, trying to control um, wheelchairs. So um, the, the hypothesis is, you know, is it possible to add a kind of a, a wheelchair controller that's, you know, a bit like a, a guide dog. Um, so it's not supposed to, it's not trying to be as intelligent as a, per, as a human, um, but um, it, it can work with a human in terms of, it. so the, it, it, the plan is that it can recognize the human's goals and then mm. try to help them. So the experiment for that is to um, use videos to analyze um, how people are um, using their wheelchairs, what they're trying to do. You know, they're trying to get through a doorway, uh, they're trying to get down a ramp, uh, you know, get from room to room. Uh, can the machine, just by looking at the behavior, you know, what's going on in the world, work out which goal is currently in operation and then switch to supporting that. So basically stop them bumping into the doorway, things like that. So um, it can have practical uses, um, but it does all come down to trying to come up with the, the experiment where you can work that stuff out. Um, yeah, so you so good question. Set up, yes, okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you, that's a good question. <laughs> um, when we look at uh, life, um, a modality that's been used is to talk about sentience as a low level beginning. So for example, a single cell might be have a photoreceptor cell within it, or a photoreceptor organ within it. And then to talk about awareness of sentience as it were, some kind of, for example, emotion, some equivalent or actual emotional response. And then uh, the ability to be aware of awareness and modify one's awareness. And within the community, there are some who talk about directiveness and purposefulness. So they keep purposefulness for humans because it implies this capacity to choose one's purpose and directiveness for everything else. So in, in that sense, it's not it's recognizing a recursive level of organization, which I think goes to your interest in to how far along the line can machines go? Um, so what would be required to be built into a machine so that it built, so that it was able to make some kind of journey? And, and where would the human beings insertion of the software or code or technology into it fit uh, as, the ex, as the actual explanation? It's merely the operation of a human being inside. Um, inside a machine. Am I making sense? Um, didn't quite get the last bit, but I, I'll answer the first bit. So, well, um, take the first bit. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take the first bit. And then come back to it. Um, so, yeah, these these machines are not learning machines. They're just kind of, um, you know, at the heart, they are just reacting to the world and sure. maybe by accident forming a, a negative feedback loop. Um, a more interesting system would be one that you know, is, is more like a homeostat that um, can actually um, you know, learn about the world and also learn about, it can observe itself what it's doing. So it can see, oh, I'm, you know, I've, I've driven forward. Um, so it, it can almost do the experiments on itself. So it, it can almost work out, oh, my purpose is to uh, drive around this, this, um, this light, um, keep, keep the angle, if it, if it can basically describe itself as well as the world, then that is that approaching sentience. Um, so it's, it doesn't have to be a language user in any sense. It's, uh, it can still be a very simple robot that's 
forming a theory of the world and, and of its place in the world. So it becomes second order um, quite naturally, hopefully. Right. But what, so your what your second point was about. Yeah, so if we take the second some, point and person, yeah. put it in some context. So if, and indeed some context for looking at all of this, if somebody designs an instrument or machine that happens to have two inverted commas eyes, in other words, light sensitive devices that are organized in such a way that they drive um, a motor, they drive a movement and you have a cross laterality that you built into the machine, then in effect, the human being has placed, because it's been designed by a human being, it's been placed into a material form, a structure that is a human structure. And by placing something that is light sensitive, you've, you've placed into that operation something which is going to be responsive to light. It's not going to suddenly be responsive to sound or liquefaction or heat or something. It's going to be responsive for light. If you put, if you put a light there, it's going to respond to it because that's what it does. That's what that device does. And you placed it into a particular organization. So that organization is going to do how you've designed it. Now, if you're saying, well, I don't quite know what this will actually do when I create it but it would be interesting to stick this form together, stick some light sources, organize it like this, which is a bit like a human being and see what happens. But you've nevertheless placed into it that kind of structure and it therefore operates the way that kind of structure operates. Would you go with that? What you're trying yeah. to do is after the event say, I, I, don't, I didn't know how this would operate, even though I designed it to operate in the way that it does. So I'm finding out after the event. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's the case even in these simple robots. I didn't exactly. Know. I'm talking yeah, about those know. simple ones. Oh, okay. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so my question would be: if you design a more complicated one, so in that sense, all the machine is doing is executing precisely what it's been designed to do. To a point. <laughs> And I'm not sure that there, there is a more than the sum of the parts. It is exactly what the sum of the parts does. But it's still surprising. When you build a robot, it's still surprising. That's only because you're ignorant of what you designed in the first place. It's not the machine is something yeah. more than the side. You've learned something you didn't know when you created it. Wouldn't no. that be true? Yes, but if you can only discover it through um, experiments, Absolutely. No problem with that yeah. at all. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but what what I'm wondering is if you build into a machine, if a human being could design into a machine the ability whereby it could actually learn from that operation mm. and improve. So you had a more complicated program with more complicated objectives and more co and built into it a recursive level of learning how to do it. Mm. It would still yeah, be I mean, exactly the same. It would be doing the way you designed it to do it. Uh, yes, one step removed. So you'd have even less idea of what it was doing and you'd be even more surprised. Um, yes, perhaps. And, and, and especially if, um, you know, it's, if it's using kind of evolutionary techniques um, and it's, you know, maybe it can bolt on different sensors, you know, it can go down the robot shop and add new sensors to itself. Uh, mm -hmm. So it can suddenly see in the infrared or uh, in the, work like a bat, you know. <laughs> but what you've done is, as soon as you worked out how it worked, everybody else can copy it and do that and know exactly what it will do. So what you're saying is it's possible for a human being to invent a structure in which we don't quite know how this structure will work. And the only way we'll quite find out how this structure works is by operating it in the world and see what happens. If yeah, so, it I mean, looks a little bit like civilization, for example. <laughs> yeah, and it's a bit like the computer. You know, there's a potential infinite number of computer programs that could be written. So you're saying, you know, Alan Turing was a bit lazy because he hadn't worked out what they were all were no, about. No, I'm not. You know? I'm, I'm not. I'm, <laughs> but I'm saying so, that would be a way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah. But it's like you, you create a, a framework where that's almost, you know, it's open-ended. Anything could happen. Um, Margaret's asking, what happens if you have two light sources? I haven't done that experiment, Margaret. <laughs> I 
I don't know. Again, more surprise. What would you predict? Uh, well, um, Grey Walter's robot follows the, the outer hull. It follows either clockwise or anti-clockwise around the kind of, an, if you drew a, a hull around different light sources, that's, that's what it would do. And that's very similar. So it might do that. Mike, oh yeah, Mike. Yep. Mike Hi. and James, yeah. Me, me again, is it okay? Um, if I assert um, uh, or posit that we as human beings become knowledgeable and intelligent through the way in which we interact with each other and uh, we learn from each other, I wonder if uh, on the evolution of an aware system rather than a discrete entity called your little robot, you've tried creating swarms with a kind of um, sensing system so that they keep a certain distance between themselves. But there's an emergent property that may arise which you could look at as a form of awareness of each other in the way in which they move. I don't know if you've um, experimented with swarming, but... Yeah, not personally. There are people in the lab who um, built these little kind of killer bots, swarm, swarm robots. Yeah. Um, are they seeing emergent behaviors? I guess. Uh, yes. Um, so yeah, it's you know it's like the game of life, Conway's game of life, isn't it? You you can devise very simple rules and you get interesting consequences when you put lots of these things together. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I, I thought you were going to make a point about kind of um, you know socially a socially constructed reality. So you know it's it's, <laughs> it's kind of you know. I, and I would agree with that too. That it's, well, it's not just what the ro the robot makes of the world; it's what you know the the culture would make of the world well, as well. The, ex the experimental method will constrain us to try and interpret what the robots are doing, and the sign mm. as Angus would point out the human being psychology onto it. So we'll project yeah. ourselves into that system. But I'm yeah. more interested yeah. from the point of view of the cybernetic point of view of any system has an emergent property. And I wondered if you were looking at um, machine intelligence and awareness as an emergent property, whether any work had been done by yourself or somebody on how swarming may actually achieve that. I guess I'm signing up for your agenda, the light that you're hitting. <laughs> <laughs> you're good, good, that's good. good <laughs> and James. Yeah, hi. Um... I mean, this is obviously rep reminiscent of Ashby's black box, right? In terms mm. of you can only measure it by inputs and outputs. And you're talking about the lack of negative feedback, but... The, uh, in vehicle uh, one, yeah. Yeah, the, the, there doesn't seem to be something in the, in, in the environment to allow it to, to have negative feedback. So to the point of having two light sources, have oh, you got wood lice, which do the same thing, so it's phototaxis, or negative phototaxis in their case, they, they move away from the light. And if you were doing a biological experiment, you'd put them in a dark thing and you'd have a light that was slightly dimmer than another light and see which one they move towards or whether, you know, wh whether they move towards, what area they move towards in a variable environment. But you've got an environment which has only got one variable or one element, which is one light source. So it's a very, um, if I've misused the term, but it's a very binary environment where the only thing they can do is to utilize their programming to react to one thing and you get the same response every time. So don't you need more variables in the environment to try and identify if it's got some form of... Uh, yeah, I mean, what, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is to kind of find what's the simplest possible system I can create that I can say something interesting about. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I should call it Occam's razor. So I'm just trying to cut away everything. So I've got you know, one simple robot, one light source, uh, and I can still say something interesting about it. Um, but, and yes, there's, there's plenty more you then build back in to show interesting things. Yeah, I mean, it's just, a, I guess the question really is, is the, it, is doing it there needs to be some i would have thought some sort of comparison because having a, having looked at the literature when they look at the double uh double light source um beasts or whatever you want to call the robots then depending on how you wire the the light sources um 
you, you, you get different responses from them. So which to me suggests it's a structural difference, which is changing the behavior because now you've got comparative items to look at. So if one's trying to define a purpose for your specific vehicle, it would seem that some other variables are required to be able to, because every time you put it in the environment, it's going to do the same thing, right? Yeah, 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 so, more or less, yeah, yeah. It's a, so to, it to starts, off at a ran, two, starts off at a random position, but it's, there's not much randomness in that, you know. Yeah, two two light sources or a, or a hill or something, some other dis, display. Yeah, so, uh, but it, it's certainly true. The, you know, the, the purpose emerges out of the interaction of the controller and its environment. It's not, it's yeah. not just a controller. It's not just the environment. It's, it's both together. And yeah, if I put in two light sources, it would change its behavior in ways that I can't predict. Um, I suspect none of, none of us can. Um, was, Margaret's comment said, you know, about talking about swarms, I kind of thought, well, what if you put lights on the on the robots themselves, you know, so the lights moving about, would, would they orbit around each other? Potentially, possibly, I don't know. Uh, that would be nice. <laughs> Or would they split off into pairs? <laughs> <laughs> We're moving on. Kind of mon monogamous robots. Towards the end, Harald has a question. Also, if there's anybody who hasn't uh, asked anything so far or commented, uh, you should think about jumping in. Harald. Um, if you design uh, a purpose into uh, a machine, um, there is a prediction uh, that certain behavior will follow. But it's not entirely clear to me uh, what the purpose in this case is. Um, I'm thinking of the Seymour Peppert uh, type of experiment with the uh, logo turtle. I don't know whether you know what it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, what happens there is that you can design a turtle. It's moved by um, certain constraints on what it can do. And the mover in general is a child, but it can be a, an engine. Now, the purpose of the turtle is not to move, but to move within constraints such that it can draw, for example, a triangle. So doing purposeful behavior is not only, uh, let us say, the direct activity, but it is actually what follows from the direct activity that we call purpose. So how would you um, in include that type of thinking in your uh, work? Um, yeah, so that kind of raises two thoughts that um, most of the kind of the floor turtles can't, they haven't got enough sensors to come, they couldn't tell what they were drawing, could they? I don't think, uh, so from, they kind of fail from a, a PCT perspective because they, they've got no perception of what they're doing. Um, but that's just a kind of a you know, technical yeah. point really. Yeah. Um, but it's the outside observer who can. And I think, um, you know, Umberto Maturana kind of would argue against, um, wait, well, he, he doesn't seem to like people designing in purpose. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it was that he would call it an allopoiesis when, um, you know, we basically program a machine. That machine has no independent existence from, from humans if, if it's just executing um, some designed in purpose. Um, whereas if, if it, if somehow its purpose can arise um, naturally and authentically from its construction, uh, you know, without um, too many preconceived notions from the human, um, then, you know, I'm hoping we can build machines with um, with selves and with with an independence from humanity. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, did you have a question you wanted to ask? You put your hand up for a moment and then took it down. I'll take it as a no. 
Uh, Steve, I want to raise one thing then if nobody else is that um, you, you, I'm, I'm going to bring- oh, Sorry, in, I, Angus. Bill's back. Oh, Hi, Bill. You were on the <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm having all sorts of problems tonight, and the fact that I've left your lecture talk several times has no indication of how interesting I have, have found <laughs> okay. um, it. Just a couple of thoughts is that when um, Wiener was talking about purposeful systems like um, anti-aircraft guns and so on and so forth those purposes were actually inbuilt by the designers mm. so yeah the, the, those purposeful systems actually got their purposes from human being as it were so we have to be very careful there that, that you know whether there are any true purposeful systems but if we're going to get into a system that can generate its own purposes the thought that occurs to me is that it must have some sort of memory as to what has happened in the past and what sort of actions have generated it getting to whatever its purpose, target, goal is from, from previous activity. So there needs to be that built into it. And apart from feedback, there needs to be some sort of feed forward in that the organism needs to be able to plan what sort of actions will will enable it to get to wherever it wants to, whatever its purpose, whatever its goal is. So um, I'm just wondering about how much memory can be built into these um, uh, into these robots that you, I mean, as I say, I found the whole talk absolutely fascinating, but is there any, uh, are you thinking of building that in or is this a much bigger program? <laughs> it's clearly a much bigger program, isn't it? <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying to, it, it's so easy to think, oh yeah, I can write some code to do that. Um, but I'm trying to take principled steps forward that aren't just me kind of allopo allopoetically coding that stuff in. It, to me, that's, that's like the anti-aircraft gun. I'm kind of building a system with a purpose where, you know, I want, I want, yeah, authentic machines in the existential sense. <laughs> uh, Margaret's got a hand up. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Oh, right. So, as I understand it, the Breitenberg um, vehicles or machines, BVs, those were created to try to poke at how natural phenomena that he's dis had discovered was wired up and how you to try and work out how it works without yeah, having to describe all these higher levels that we're busy talking about. That, that's, am I correct, right? So he was really trying to say, if you take a nerve and you put it to something like that, how does it actually work? What is the principle that governs it? It's um, it, it, whatever it is it, that it does. He's basically teaching us neurophysiology. That's right, um, exactly. Neuroscience. Um, but through kind of an embodied, an this embodied approach. Little wood lights, yeah, that yeah. exactly. This little wood lights, which you spoke about, this amazing way that it moves its legs. Am I correct? Do I recall correctly? Uh, why yes. yeah. now? Is it because I don't have much physics background? But why would the body have evolved this crossover function of the from the sensory apparatus to the motor apparatus? Let's. Go. You see, that's first on first level. I'm having a trouble with why like well, that. I'm not surprised. Nobody knows, quite frankly. Uh, ah, there's so a good you've reason for it. Obviously, got a BV that doesn't have the crossover. Uh, vehicles, yeah, yeah. If, um, if we go to, oh, I've got to share my screen, haven't I? Uh, Thank you. So you can see this this vehicle is this has got the crossover in its in its little brain. Then, so one thing about Breitenberg, he's not just giving us the mechanical description of these things. He's saying he's giving us this kind of lovely poetic description as well. So um, I've summarised that as aggression here. So he's saying this is aggressive because it starts off by kind of trying to ram the uh, the thing here at the beginning. But there's another vehicle without the crossover which has got totally different behavior, um, which Breitenberg describes as fearful. You might say this is kind of fanciful 
uh, notion, but um, I think he's leading us along the path of to saying, well, you know, there is a different level here at play. There's the kind of the neuroscience, and then there's this other level about what, you know, what, what does it mean? I'm not saying that all systems without their brains crossed over would act fearfully. That's not the case, but you can see that they, there's a difference, a functional difference. That's fascinating. I shall stop that now. Um, we're coming up towards the end. Can I just hypothesize and maybe ask you to answer one question? Of course. Um, you talked about perceptual control theory and cybernetics, and uh, as if they weren't necessarily, what you were describing wasn't necessarily identical, that the, everything you were describing wasn't as cybernetic as it is per, per PCT. So if we leave out all of the sort of sociology of the two and the, the biographical history of the two and the sensitivities that people in the two communities may or may not have, and imagine there are none of them, do you personally find anything about what you're describing as PCT that couldn't equally be cybernetic? Um, no, I, I, I find them entirely compatible with each other. Um, so, you know, this is why I'm saying, you know, Bill Powers put a, hom a homeostat at the core of this thing. Yep. Know? That's how it's, I thought. It's, that's how it's I cybernetics. Yeah. He started off, <laughs> yeah. started off calling it cyber, a cybernetic method. And, yeah. And then very so things it, happened. It was only social reasons why he felt excluded. Now, maybe excluded himself. Who knows? But um, it's, it's just a real shame, you know. But from, it's for, from, Eddie, from everybody's point of view. As, as you've illustrated, it's an incredibly powerful way of approaching cybernetic uh cybernetics and learning how cybernetics functions and i i s totally endorse it for anybody who's not familiar with it it's very useful mm. and the um, fact it's got a methodology you know we i'd like to have a methodology for other cybernetic techniques you know like vsm things like that absolutely um you last yeah. last word steve what would you like um what would you like that anybody should do with this, the world should do with this. <laughs> it's got limited application as it, as it, as it stands. Um, uh, it's trouble, I, I focus so much on this today, I've kind of forgotten, oh, what, what, what's the background to this? Um, yeah. I don't know. Another, that's, an, that's for another talk. Another day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I'm trying to take this off in lots of directions. I'm, I'm going to uh, bring this meeting to a formal close. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming along and joining the conversation. Um, thank you, especially, Steve, for bringing along your demonstration, your fascinating introduction, and lying behind that, if you like, the manner in which you're exercising the process of saying, I want to find out how this works and doing something um, to explore it and learn from it. So I, just we... say, I love the way people in the comments are proposing experiments. That's such a great um, attitude, yeah. you know, to it's great. try this, try that, you know, yeah. Yeah. So although the machines may not quite be able to learn quite yet, uh, I observe a, a room or a, a virtual room full of people all learning and exploring and so on and that's wonderful mm. thank you steve can we all yeah thanks thank you <laughs>